So this, this is the, the staff, just to give you an idea of how big it was. Um, I don't have an actual number yet on how many people were here, but for a 215 bed hospital, they had a lot of people. They had a lot of people in here. Each one of these buildings at the top is a ward and they were air conditioned. Mm -hmm. So Germans in Fort Myers, how many knew that we had Germans, POWs here in Fort Myers? Mm -hmm. Anybody? How many knew we had German POWs in Florida? Someone <clears throat> told me that. Okay, so there was about 200 POWs assigned to the Fort Myers area. They were assigned to Page Field. The problem with Page Field is they only had 1,500 people out there. It was a small airfield, so they gave them to Buckingham. Buckingham ended up getting 175 of them. They had to house them out at Buckingham. If you look in the in the uh, cabinet I got over here, I have three German uh, coins that I found where the POW camp was. Most of them were enlisted. Only a few were Germans, and a very few were SA or SS. Now, we took over uh, the Mediterranean, basically, and they had to do something with all the Germans that were surrendered. You had your Germans, which were, I'm captured, okay, the war's over, I don't care, do what you want. Then you had your diehard Nazis, which were the, the German Navy, the submariners, and the SS and the SA. They were dedicated to Hitler. They were going to do anything that they possibly could, even here in the United States. When they came to Florida, they went to Camp Blanding. Camp Blanding sent them out <clears throat> to the different bases throughout the Florida. That's how Buckingham got involved with this. The ones that we had were screened and they knew that they weren't going to be a threat or a danger to society, so they brought them down. We educated them. Why would we educate the enemy? We educated them because we knew that we were eventually going to win the war, and we had to return them to Germany. Most of these Germans had elementary school education. They didn't know how to read, they didn't know how to write, they didn't know how to add. Once they got old, they were old enough to work, they were sent out to the fields. So here we basically taught them literature, we let them listen to motion pictures, radio, let them read our newspapers. We basically taught them that way. Edison College had a course, the Red Cross had a course that would come in and teach them English, teach them math and educate them. We also had them work for us. Now because of the Geneva Convention, it was very, we had to be very careful how we did this. So what they did is they automatically paid them 10 cents a day for being here, for being a POW. They gave them 80 cents for working in the fields. So what they did is the government went to the farmers and said, we'll give you X number of prisoners to work in your field and you pay us the, the 80 cents an hour or whatever, a day or whatever it was, and they paid them in script. Why would they pay them in this? Why, why would they do that? What's that? That's right. Because if they gave them Amer American currency, these guys could break out of camp and buy their way home. So they gave them script. This is what the script was. They could go into the canteen and buy anything that they wanted because they earned the money. They bought toiletries, extra food, American cigarettes. They were allowed two beers a day per person. Now, the beer back then, the beer we have today is 6%. What was it back then? It, it was 3-2 beer. Yeah, so two beers was nothing for them back then. So they could buy paper, pencils, cards, whatever they wanted. So education was done usually at night and on the weekends, and we taught them how to read, write, engineering, science. We were teaching them everything that they were going to need to go home to rebuild their country. So life around the airfield, does anybody know what this little farm looking building is? It's on Buckingham Road still today, isn't it? I yeah, recognize that. Yeah. Yep. That is the Buckingham store. 
So family were allowed on the base. They had to have a pass before they could get on the base. Uh, they did have one espionage situation that occurred from a person who was employed to work on the base. It was a female. She was American Italian. She was seen with a known German. Uh, I don't know what they would call him, but he, he was a, a German in downtown Fort Myers. He always had a lot of money. He was always dressed very well. And she was seen with him almost every night. She was found in a spot on the base that she wasn't supposed to be. They questioned her, let her go, and from that point on, both of them disappeared. They went back and inspected the area where she was at, and they found fire extinguishers, the old big brass fire extinguishers, full solvent. So she was planning on burning something up. After hours activities could be anything that they wanted to do. They had a two lane bowling alley, two movie theaters, an animal theater, an Olympic sized swimming pool that was outside, a recreation center, and they also had a recreation center down on Fort Myers Beach. It ended up getting destroyed in 1945 by a hurricane. So USO dances, that was really, really, really important to have dances Back in the 40s, that's what everybody did. Everybody danced. So they would have it in downtown, they would have it on the base. Where was the USO here in Fort Myers? Hall 56. Where? Hall 56. It, it, 56. Yeah, it was on Edwards Drive. It, it's actually half of the building is still there. Yeah. No, the it's pleasure, right across from the Marine. The Pleasure Pier. Right. What, from the Pleasure Pier? Uh, yeah. So it was actually a bigger building. I have a picture, I didn't add it to the slides. But there was a second USO. Where was the second one? I didn't talk much about this diverse group. It was right on the other side of the road tracks, on Safety Hill. The very first building on the right hand side is a two story building. We're getting ready to McCollum Hall. Hall. Yes, that was a USO. It's for the, uh, the blacks that were stationed at Buckingham. So dances were a big thing back then. They would bus girls in from Arcadia, from Naples, wherever they could to dance with the guys. Yeah. It was a big deal. They would also have uh, dances on the airfield and they would have a band brought in to play. A variety of activities that they could do, volleyball, football, baseball, you name it, they did it out here. Uh, one of the things was church. They had two church buildings on the base, but they could deliver any type of service from any domination that was needed. There's one of the churches in the background. There's a guy named Charlie Flint. Does anybody know that name? Yeah, Flint and Doyle. They moved that building. Does anybody know where they moved it to? Right by Chandler Hall. Right by Chandler Hall. It was torn down in the late 90s, early 2000s. And that was the building, one of the buildings that they moved. So I don't know why, but in the group of pictures that I got, this British Lancaster was there. I think that this was a war bonds drive because where else did the British go? There were British being trained here in Florida. Does anybody know where? Oh, uh, Arcadia. Arcadia had two places up there, and there was another one out by Cluiston in Belle Glade. Those were uh, uh, British training bases run by Emory Riddle. I think that's why that British Lancaster was here. The Brazilians, they did train uh, people from other countries that were our allies. They did, uh, on occasion, train them here. So it took me forever to figure out the uniform, but I ended up figuring out it was Brazil. Some notable persons. Let's see how good you people are with, with faces and names. Named after a beer. 
Miller. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Glenn Miller, yeah. Unfortunately, his plane disappeared when he was going from Europe to uh, England in the English Channel. They never found his airplane. Anybody, who's the sports people? Lou Rick, Cincinnati Reds. He was a, such a big baseball player that they ended up creating two baseball teams at Buckingham and they traveled around the United States playing the other bases before he was shipped off to the South Pacific where he created another baseball team down there. <laughs> Memphis Bell. Does any, can anybody tell me the story of the Memphis Bell? It was the first airplane to finish all the missions. And they brought him home. They sent the plane in and crew around the United States for a war bond drive. Judy Garland. Yes, she was here. She was here. What movie did she play in? Real famous movie, 1930s. Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Clark Gable. All right, Clark Gable. A lot of people say that he went to gunnery school here. He did not. He went to gunnery school in Tyndall Air Force Base up in the Panhandle. Once he graduated, he was brought down here for the USO and for war bond drive. Once he completed his mission here and greeted everybody, he went overseas and his job was to evaluate the flexible gunnery operation in Europe as an end result. He came back and reported back to the United States on his findings. Anybody know that guy? Charles Bronson. Yeah. Charles Bronson. Wow. He was a student here. Wow. And then he also became an instructor. The instructor school here in Fort Myers was the first one in the United States. And he was in the second group before being sent to uh, Las Vegas, where he ended up being an instructor in Las Vegas. Bob Hope and Jerry Koala. <laughs> yes, they were here and they were very popular. They apparently they were here twice. And all of these women, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, been here several times. Mrs. Edison, Danny Kay, a whole bunch of people. In 39 months, there was a lot of people that floated through here for the USO. It was either for the USO or war bonds or what have you. Okay, the WASPs, Women's Air Service Pilots. These were women, it was a civilian organization created behind the scenes by Eleanor Roosevelt and another lady because these women already knew how to fly, they already had their ratings, might as well use them. So that's why the US government created the WASP program. These are the women that flew here in Fort Myers. So Jacqueline Cochran was the basically the chief of the WASP out of Washington, D.C. She was best friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. When she needed something done, she went to Eleanor and it got done. All right, so these are all the WASPs that, that they had here in Fort Myers. When they came into town, when they arrived here for their operation, the base commander made them fly mail in a T-6 to other bases around. They wouldn't let them fly. They wouldn't let them do their job. So they got a hold of Jacqueline Cochran. They sent her a telegram, said you need to report to Fort Myers as soon as possible. Three days later, she shows up, has a meeting with the girls. They explain, hey, we're not flying. They're not letting us do what we need to do. She said, I'll take care of that right now. At the time, she was a major. The guy that runs the base is a colonel. Colonel's up here, major's down here. She went in and told him off. The secretary could hear her arguing and yelling at him. That day, the girls were in the planes flying. They were flying to, uh, foreign bombers, whatever they wanted, they were flying it immediately. So, uh, Julie Ledbetter up there stayed in. She ended up going into the reserves after World War II, retired as a lieutenant colonel in 1970. Uh, colonel Cochran did the same thing. She stayed in. She actually has world records to her name for flying. A lot of these women were test pilots. She was also a test pilot 
and she flew with Chuck Yeager on a regular basis. Dawn Seymour, the girl sitting in the cockpit of the, the plane up there. I had the honor of meeting her a few years ago. On a whim, I found her daughter lived in Naples. And I said, I'd like to talk to your mom. And I explained what I was doing. She says, she's gonna be here next week. We'll come up and have lunch. I said, okay, great. So we had her come out to Buckingham Airfield. They pulled in to the hangar at the sheriff's office. She got out of the car and just straight into the building. That woman was a wealth of information. She had more ratings, more flying hours in World War II than anybody on the airfield. Wow. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Ledbetter, Lieutenant Colonel Ledbetter was the second that had the most fly time. She could outfly anybody on the airfield. When she was talking to us, she said, this is the first time I've been on this airfield since I left in 1944. Mm -hmm. And she said, where's the control tower? I said, well, we don't have a control tower anymore. She said, well, can you show me where it was? We took her over there and showed her the four marks in the runway, right next to the runway where the uh, control tower was. And she said, that building right next to it is where I met my husband. Oh. Within six months, we were married. Wow. And she said, I re resigned my commission and we moved to Maxwell Air Force Base. That's Dawn. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the pilot all the way to the left, she was a Army helicopter pilot. She got into flying as a result of a scholarship put on by Don uh, Seymour in the organization she worked with. When this girl walked in, she introduced herself, and Dawn said, I remember you. Mm. So we all backed off, let her talk, let them have their, their time together, and the girl walked away crying. She couldn't, um, she was totally amazed that Dawn even remembered her. So that picture was taken in 2015. She was a wealth of information. So they also had women that worked behind the scenes on the base, control tower, um, in the kitchen, you name it. They worked there, along with civilian personnel, but these women were actually military. So the war's over. This is an actual uh, photocopy of one of the flyers that they sent out. The War Assets Administration came in and evaluated the entire base and started liquidating everything. Planes were being sent off to other airfields. They were being mothballed. Everything was being sold and auctioned off. Um, any buildings were auctioned off, they had to tear them completely down all the way themselves. So this is how Charlie Flint got his business. He went to the airfield with, from what his book said, $35, bought as much tools as he could, and then turned around and sell them at the main gate. Some people came up and said, hey, can you help us move this building? We want to take this building and move it down off of Tice Street or move it down off of Iona Road or wherever. And he said, sure, this is how much I'll charge you. And he'd get his pickup truck and his trailer, and they'd move the building. That's how he got his start, $35. Wow. So the gates closed for the last time in 1948. That's when it officially closed. Delbert Osborne was the last person to close it, lock the gate, turn the keys over. The government wanted to keep the base, keep a very small portion of it for a strategic air command because Korea and they knew other things were getting ready to happen. Fort Myers couldn't afford it. Lee County couldn't afford it. So they auctioned off the land. And that's how the Lehigh Corporation came into play. The first place they built was the road off of Astoria. That's the first place the Lehigh Corporation built. The rest of it is history with Lehigh Acres. Fort Myers News Press article that I was able to get a hold of, and this is today. So Lee County Sheriff's Office, Aviation, and Training Division are out there. Lee County Mosquito Control, and then all of your private pilots that live on the airfield that fly out on a regular basis. The other side of the airfield is used for uh, the police academy, the fire academy, for their driver's training, and also there's an auto club that drives out there on a regular basis. Today, there are only three buildings that remain one of them is on mosquito control property, another one is a private house, and the other one is the former um, Federal Housing Authority, 
which is on private property and the building has not been touched since 1948. So I looked at it a few years ago and I was dumbfounded. But it's all falling apart, but I mean, it's history as soon as you walk in. But th this is all that's left of Buckingham Airfield now. Any questions? Mm -hmm. oh,